is Uganda's public debt sustainable? That question today will be answered by students of Cavendish University. I welcome you to this week's edition of Inter-University Debate, which is brought to you by Center for Constitutional Governance and Civics Best TV. I'm the moderator for the talk show. My name is Fancy Jenga Lake. Now, as I earlier mentioned, we are hosting students of Cavendish University. You're welcome to the Inter-University Debate. Thank you. Okay, so this week we are discussing the question, is, this, is Uganda's debt sustainable? Let me introduce the panelists for today's discussion. I'll start with the gentleman that has been on this talk show for I don't know how many times, <laughs> so many times, <laughs> is very familiar to this TV session, and that is Mr. Aruho Brian. Brian is a student at Cavendish University pursuing Bachelor of Laws. Brian, you're welcome to the inter-university debate. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity once again. Okay. We here to break down a few things. Okay, we'll, we'll definitely break them down. <laughs> okay, our second panelist for today is Ms. Nandera Elizabeth. She's a year two student pursuing Bachelor of Laws at Cavendish University. Elizabeth, you're welcome. Thank you. Okay, our third panelist is Mr. Male Enoch. Enoch is also a law student, he's in his first year. Uh, Enoch, you're welcome to the Thank show. You. Okay. Our fourth panelist is in her second year, pursuing still Bachelor of Law. So we have a panel of lawyers. Miss um, Apollo Vivian. Vivian, you're welcome. Humble to be here. Okay. So we are discussing the question, is Uganda's public debt sustainable? So right from, we have had the question on uh, debt, Uganda's debt, the rise of Uganda's debt. It has been grappling here for a very long time. Right from we saw when the budget was read, it, it was clearly stated that Uganda has over 73 trillion in debt. And that is both domestic and uh, external. It means Uganda has been borrowing from internal sources as well as external sources like we have seen the Exim Bank of China, IMF, World Bank. So we have also seen the report from World Bank, IMF, uh, Bank of Uganda. And according to World Bank, uh, recently stated that Uganda has bounced back well after the COVID period. But we still have the issue of debt. Even when the budget was spread, Uganda is funding the budget by both debt and, um, and, and other sources, which includes uh, collecting taxes. So let me start with you, uh, Brian. I will start with, I'll start with the person who has taken, uh. who has been on this show the, <laughs> the most number of times, you know. So let me start with you, Brian. So Brian, what is the current status quo? We have seen several reports come in. So what, what's the current status quo of Uganda in terms of uh, public debt? Well, thank you. Uh, well, our status quo has never changed, really, for the past uh, nearly three or four years. It's one that has always been worrying to the state and uh, also to the citizens as well, the people. If you had to recall very well in 2018, um, Minister Matia, Matia Kasaija said that uh, by 2020, 20, 20, 2021, his estimate was that uh, would, uh, almost every Ugandan would be earning 1.3 million, which was a, a more of a theoretical talk. Mm. Well, and um, 2021 reached, and then we had a report, which when you calculate closely well enough, it nearly means that each Ugandan has a debt of 2.3, around 2.3, 2.5 million Ugandan students to pay off. That is to start with. So whether our status quo is actually worrying or not, uh, that is a question for another day. But uh, we, are, we are at a point where we do know that we, if we do not change a few things here, here or there, we are going to have a debt that is not going to be able to be paid by us and may, it, may not affect us directly. We may not feel the pain right now, but it will be felt by the generations to come. Because if you are to look at uh, several reports, including the one of World Bank and IMF, specifically the one by IMF, it's actually one that is worrying. Even given the fact that they put an exclusion of saying, you know, we have bounced back well among the countries uh, generally in the world that, uh, you know, made a recap of what happened during COVID and uh, tried to, you know, keep their markets intact and, uh, they addressed a few things here and there, a few things that maybe would have affected us because of COVID, and uh, that includes uh, 
imported inflation because we had the number of uh, now after after the whole COVID saga and the economies are being spent, we had a very big intake of imports, uh, which is um, contrary to what we ought to be having. We ought to be having a bigger number of exports, and that was the contrary. So the IMF is coming up and actually telling us that look, you guys, whereas you are <coughs> developing, yes, whereas you're bouncing back on the economy, you still have a larger debt. Yeah. So and looking at the region we are also in, I think we are really doing pretty bad. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Brian, for that. Let me move to Elizabeth. So, Elizabeth, the size of Uganda's debt has been growing over the years. What are some of the attributes to the growing, you know, to the growing trend in borrowing? Uh, well, if I'm to look at uh, Uganda's uh, economy and ratio it with Uganda's debt, in most cases when Uganda is borrowing money from maybe the domestic borrowing and foreign borrowing, in most cases, they happen to borrow money to pay off debts as well. They do not borrow money maybe to invest in, uh, uh, in a project. And even if they do get that money, that, uh, even if they borrow money and invest in a project, they don't, uh, the, the, the project they invest on does not set off. It, it can set off, but it does, not, it, it, does not be, uh, it does not grow. It's not fruitful at all, according to the amount of money that they have, they have borrowed. And that leaves, obviously, Uganda at a very terrible state as, as, as a country. And then um, I think the other issue is the fact that, well, uh, we do borrow money, yes, but we do not really use the money appropriately. Because even when the, maybe uh, the, the Minister of Finance, the Ministry of Finance gets the money and uh, allocates it to the various uh, environments, you know, it's supposed to do this, it's supposed to do that. Still, there are people that are not patriotic enough to do what the money is supposed to be used for. They happen to retain the money for their own benefit. And that is leaving Uganda at, at stake. Because, I mean, for us uh, uh, students that are actually at, uh, that are not at the, the level of, of uh, uh, we who are not at that point whereby we can see things physically, that actually this is happening to us, we are the ones to suffer in the wrong run. It's it's not basically the the the, the, the generous themselves, I should say. <laughs> and then um, maybe the other issue as to uh, the reason as to why our debts are still raising, it's because we do not have an economic drive in Uganda that we have really invested in. While I was doing my research, I got to realize that our economic drive is agriculture. But if we are to look into really agriculture, it's just a number of people, few people that have blossomed in that field. It's it's not it's not the whole country. It's very few people, and that is that that really does a disservice to our country, Uganda. Because honestly, if just our our economic drive is only uh, successfully brought out by countable people, then we are really at a very bad position. It's, it's not really uh, convincing enough for agriculture to be, um, to be our economic drive, of, of which it is supposed to be because, I mean, we have good fertile soils. I remember when I was growing up, I used to, uh, to, to engage myself in cultural, uh, uh, growing cash crops. Uh, cotton, coffee, something that I no longer see in my village and something that would have been, uh, 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 would have attributed something to our country, Uganda. Okay. Thank you, Elizabeth. Let me move to Enoch and I'll ask you still the same question that I asked uh, Elizabeth. The growing um, trend in borrowing in Uganda, what are some of the reasons? Corruption and embezzlement. Like, you find funds being used uh, very inappropriately and you start diverting them from actually, you start, you start from the day you receive the money, we mean the people who are civil servants, when they receive the money and then they end up maybe using it for different purposes for their personal use. Um, there are very many cases we've seen. So when we deviate the finances we have been given to do a particular thing and we deviate them to, to, to do another thing, then such a thing is not complete, it's not done to its completion, then we shall need to borrow again. Another thing when we talk about, because we as uh, Uganda, we need to watch our macroeconomics or the primary balance. We mean 
things like the balance of payments, like we talked about the exports and imports. You talk about the unemployment, you talk about the national resource mobilization through taxation. Uh, you look at uh, the inflation. So we need to borrow because when these are not in check, the primary balance or the, the, the macroeconomics, then we need to borrow because we need to put them on a balance. We find that when revenue is collected, it's not really enough. So if it's not enough, the only way we have to fill up the gap is by borrowing. So I think that's why we need to keep on borrowing all the time, which causes the public debt. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll get back to you later on basically two issues. The, you raised issues of corruption and then continuously borrowing to, to pay debts. Let me get to Vivian. So the constant borrowing by government um, of Uganda, do you find it justifiable in your own understanding? Thank you. I really don't think it's justifiable because if Uganda was borrowing money for investment, it would make sense. But Uganda is borrowing money to pay salaries. I would say Uganda is borrowing money for people to eat. You get, they are not putting the money in the right places for Uganda to grow and for us to pay up our debts with time. You realize most of the money that is being borrowed, like, excuse me to say this, but if the state house is taking up a lot of money from our budget, what, what are you doing as the ruling officials around, our MPs, our members of parliament, our ministers. You, for example, the money that ministers and MPs are given for buying cars. I feel that is a lot of money. There are cheaper cars that they can use. You understand? That money can be spent on something else. The health sector is really lacking and health is really important. When we had COVID, you realized we had to borrow a lot of money from people. And people donated, companies donated, but where did that money go? Where are those cars that they bought? Are they being used after COVID? After the COVID has, has since we have, since Uganda has been declared COVID free, where have these cars been taken? The infrastructure that was built during COVID, what is it being used for right now? Is it yielding any result or they're just there dying? I feel that is the major reason as to why Uganda, I feel our borrowing is useless. If we're borrowing to invest, it would make sense, but we are borrowing to eat, which... Okay. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Brian, I heard you say a oh, while wow, on borrowing. <laughs> <laughs> but let's, let's pick one aspect uh, that came out from, from Vivian, came out from Enoch. Let's talk mm. about the issues of corruption in the country. Recently, I was watching news when I saw the IGG herself talk about mm. the, the reports, the corruption within KCCA and um, with, uh, she was talking about NSSF mm. which is now at the forefront, the forefront. being discussed. Yeah. Yes. So Brian, I'll come back to you and my question is what hasn't Uganda done? Mm. You know, I've, I've changed the phrasing of the question because mm. You understand we have an anti-corruption code. Yeah. We have IGG. Mm -hmm. We have anti-corruption act. We have worn t-shirts and they are torn. We've, <laughs> we, we've also we've also held the national prayers. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Even yes, we have also had walks. Yeah, yeah, you know, walks and corruption walks. So what has Uganda done in terms of ending corruption? What are we not doing? Well, we haven't been serious with any of the things we are doing. Because, you see, corru corruption is something very broad and corruption can run away from money to other, you know, how you favor people in uh, certain things, yeah. But to make things clear, one, you cannot say you're holding national prayers to end corruption and think corruption will end. That, that is uh, a rather very, very, very disturbing mindset, yeah. Secondly, you cannot hold, what did you call them again, works. To yeah, end corruption. We have, we have had end corruption yeah. walks. People will come for the walks, yes, because maybe the president is coming, one, two, two big people are going to come and people want to take pictures with them. It's just more of a social event. Yeah. Again, when you organize the national prayers, why I'm saying it won't work is because when you're organizing the national prayers, this is not a pro bono service. 
you're going to incur money in the thing. So when you present the budget to person A, highest chances that they will inflate it. You know, because if we tell you guys we want it to be like 50 million, you're not going to give 50, uh, I'm not going to present the final budget to you, agenda as, as 50 million, I'll also put in like maybe 60 or 70 million, and you who's implementing or maybe asking, you may ask for more money. That is, if we decide to look at corruption from the point of um, money, yeah, so you're just indirectly promoting more corrupt tendencies. You may know it, you may know it, you may not know it, but you're, you, so we aren't yet serious to that bit. If we are to take a leap from countries that are actually taking this thing serious, look at uh, countries like South Korea, look at our, our, our neighbor just down here, Rwanda, you know, it, it, it shows you how people are actually serious about corruption. We have the Anti-Corruption Act, yes, things are there, and, and it, I was giving people a rather very wild idea, and, uh, you know, it's, it's not something everyone will believe in, but uh, off air when we were with them earlier on, I was telling her, if you could just start by, you know, the fish never rots from the tail, it rots from the head. Yeah, if you could just get 0.2% of the government officials who are practicing corruption, and you hang one, just one person <laughs> public, or, or you cane one person publicly, no one would want to be embarrassed, right? Would they? You wouldn't. Now, the thing in South Korea is that the president can actually shoot you or order for your shooting should they find out that you're corrupt. In Rwanda, you know, if you're a public servant and you are engaged in acts of corruption, that means the next 10 years you may not necessarily serve in public service on top of the fines and the imprisonment. Now, which is different from Uganda where, you know, well, the guys drive their Lexuses, their Penconies, and things like that. But we also have we also have um, imprisonment in yeah. the law. Yeah, we had the case of the minister. And where did things end? The person was just like, yes, the imprisonment, it, you see, the problem is that we are implementing corruption from, uh, uh, we are looking at it from the people that actually have no influence. So we shall go into maybe NSSF, then we look like maybe for the accountant, but yet they are bigger people. You see, corruption, we are at a stage where it's now being implemented majorly by the bigger players. The untouchable, someone said the, the, the Gambano Nogus, the people we call Gambano Nogus, and there is no way. That's why I'm saying we are not serious about it. Because if we're serious about it, we'd actually make this a very public thing. It's not about the Twitter influence. It's not about, you know, it's, it's, it's not about the church prayers. It's about implementing actually what is there. Yeah. Because if we got brand and we have a record on brand for being corrupt for A, B, C, D, and we create awareness that this, this person has a corruption case against them, and you know it's well aired, and you know the judges come and sit on it. We actually show people that look, let this at least be your standpoint. See from this person what will happen to this person. If we put them to jail, you know, and if we are really transparent and accountable, and this person actually goes to jail for those ten years, no one would really want to go to jail for ten years. It it discredits them, and leave alone even their family images. So at the end of the day, we are really not very serious. If we're serious, would be at the level of South Korea and uh, Rwanda. At least they have implemented that part. Okay, thank you, Brian. Let me move to Elizabeth on the same issue. So Elizabeth, in a position of, of power, let's say IGG, where you have to implement policies, what policies do you think Uganda should have in place at this time uh, to be able to fully cap the issue of corruption? Well, personally, I think Uganda has really has really set laws that are against the issue of corruption. Like Brian really stated, the issue here is implementation. And generally, uh, we are look, in most cases, when we're addressing the issue of corruption, we address it in a broad, uh, a broad, uh, a broad overview. And even the state, even when people come out to talk about corruption, there is no specific identification of the corrupt people. So if we continue talking about corruption as a broad thing or as, as something broad, we shall continue having corrupt citizens. Because if we cannot really spot out the corrupt people publicly and we stay within, I was, I was, I was talking to my dad about the same issue and he told me that if Uganda cannot really spot out someone publicly uh -huh. and they look at issues broadly, we shall still have uh, the virus of corruption within ourselves. So basically, it's literally identifying people and bringing them on board, and you know, taking the the, the because there the, are um, there are punishments for people that are actually venture into the aspect of corruption. Mm -hmm. 
So if if we are not bringing people on board, it's just like coming here and maybe uh, you find a number of people saying uttering words and you come and be like, who among of you, who, who has really said this among all of you? No one will come up and say it was me. No one. Everyone will be within themselves and they will stay silent. But the virus will continue. The moment you move out of the place, people will continue doing the same thing. So it's a matter of pinpointing the person and bringing them on board. And also, uh, this goes back to the president himself. Is it just about organizing rallies and maybe walk, uh, walking and also national fairs? <laughs> I think it's not about that. And I think, personally, I, I look at it as a way of mocking Ugandans. It's, it's, you're really mocking us. That was a way of mocking us. Because I know the president himself has gotten these his problems at his desk and I'm pretty sure he knows he can spot out the corrupt people and I'm sure he in in a way he um, oversees all these organizations in Uganda and all these uh, departments in Uganda so if we happen to get maybe money or funding from different uh, different uh, uh, foreign foreign uh, if we do foreign borrowing and domestic borrowing and then uh, money is uh, uh, money is allocated in different departments, and work is not being done. The question has to get to those people. So if there is nothing that is being done, if people are not being pointed, if we are still looking at things in general overviews, we shall still come here and talk and talk and talk, which is not helping the country. Yes, Brian. Yes, maybe if if we are to recall the time when uh, Justice Catherine Bagame was put at the helm of the land question, remember that that's a time when different people now started running to clean up their files. Yeah, people are actually going back to to the local citizens who they grab land from and you know trying to you know put in a word here and they are compassed because you didn't want to be publicly ashamed. Yeah, so if we would have a session like that, now we are missing a session like that. If we can just have six months. Of at least what Justice Catherine Bamge and Mary and the whole board did during that time, right now would really be fun. Because you see, then people are running. People are actually declaring that, no, okay, maybe this was was gotten in a, in a very illegal way. There were punishments. Pe people are actually on the run and they were scared. If we can have that for corruption, be pretty much well. Okay. Okay. Let me have uh, Elizabeth one more time and then we push to Enoch. Yeah, well, the other issue is the fact that we have a domat citizenry. <laughs> no, okay, yeah, we appear to be a bit. Um, if you look at social media and uh, social media, we appear to be very, to be really very lively in the light of social me social media. Mm. But coming on board, our citizens are really dormant. We, we are, are not ready to really fight for yes. our rights. We are very verbal. We are, yeah, we are very verbal. <laughs> okay, uh, let, let me ask you something on that, Elizabeth. Yes. The citizens have for so many times gone on the street and demonstrated. Yeah. You find your tear gassed, you're killed, and several things done to you. We have seen drones, and then we have seen Computer Misuse Act coming. We have seen even when POMA has been nullified, mm -hmm. police technically still implements it. Yeah. So what more would you expect the citizens to do in well, such a scenario? Um, thank you very much. It's a group of uh, a, a small group of citizens that actually come up and do the demonstrations. The, 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 act, the art of dormant citizenry uh, spreads to even people who choose to uh, choose fear over a good nation. I mean, if, let, let me say for instance, if I'm from Busia, if the whole of Busia came up to demonstrate against maybe a member of parliament who is not uh, effecting her roles as she's supposed to do, if they all come up to demonstrate about a particular person, do you really think that the government would look at it lightly? Do you think that drones would actually uh, maybe uh, take the whole district? Take, uh, the whole, whole the district. district? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Elizabeth. Let me move to Enoch. Uh, corruption was just uh, one aspect mm -hmm. that has come out from the panel, but there is also one thing that has come out from the 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 policymakers themselves, COVID-19. Mm. World Bank says we have rebounded well. Now, in your own perspective, how do you, how, do you feel like Uganda has recovered from the effect of COVID-19? 
Well, yeah, we have uh, recovered because uh, the economy was opened. Basically, we are doing with the closed economy. When I say the economy, we are meaning the the micro business, the SMEs, the small medium enterprises. They there is a way they contribute too much to the resource mobilization. I mean the revenue, the tax revenue. So, I think by the time they were opened, mm -hmm. government started making business, started collecting those little pennies they were getting. So again. During the COVID-19, we had those kind of economic shocks, they, which of course we, we, had no, we had no way to manage them because it was beyond us, because it was such a disease that it went worldwide. When business was closed, a person who was earning a dollar, this time was resorting to maybe crime to earn a dollar. Am I getting, am I getting it? So after the COVID-19, in my perspective, government injecting in money we see even it boring having supplementary budgets to facilitate the smes i think there's a way the, the economy was boosted still to the other context of uh, a debt a public debt government borrowing the obligation of fulfilling its its securities and everything when we borrow without us thinking the aspects of corruption and we invest it the public investment there is a dividend we shall get. So maybe I'll, 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 I'll walk away from saying maybe we, we, we shouldn't borrow to, we should borrow. When we borrow and we, we take that money exactly where we want it to be, I think it will be working for us. Then maybe going back to the aspect of corruption, I wouldn't like to be so much of an academia, thinking that way of the policies and everything, mm. no. We first need to deal with the structure because if you put him as a deputy, then we put a second deputy, then the third deputy. Then the third deputy there is a way the flow of money starts reducing from the point you've been given. I don't know if you get it. So I have a scenario where in uh, other developed countries, maybe like Finland, Japan, I've seen it work. When they get money maybe from World Health Organization or maybe the UN or World Bank or IMF, it goes particularly to the ministry. Mm -hmm. The minister has himself, is the one to answer, if at all, anything, is to go and do anything that is not within the plan. Inside of us having, Mr. Ruho, Oho Naribaruho, is the president, we have a vice, we have a vice president too, because we can see money shifting. From the time, from the president, something is cut off. The second, it's cut off. So if we can deal with the structures administratively. administratively, then I think for me, the public debt, the discussion you're having is sustainable. Okay. We, uh, I will come back to Elizabeth. Let me first move back to, let me move to Vivian. So Vivian, we are still talking about COVID-19 um, pandemic that affected the whole world. Now, the, the issue of the debt, it has also been attributed to the COVID-19 effect, which led to the increment in the debt. And I'll ask you a similar question that I asked Enoch. Do you think it was justifiable, the borrowing in the COVID-19? Or do you think Uganda should have better prepared for such a season? Um, I don't think Uganda should have prepared because things happen, this is life, you don't know what is coming ahead of you. The borrowing was justifiable because a lot had to be done and we didn't have the money and people are dying. These are a lot of people's lives in the government's hands. They had to do something. The borrowing was justifiable, but the way the funds were used is my issue. I, I overwatched news during COVID time. <laughs> When everyone, yeah, everyone, everyone was forced to watch the news. Is the time they were reading people, the, the companies that donated stuff mm, to the to the government? If you're to calculate that money and the money that was donated to us from the world that is excluding people in Uganda, I feel that money should have done way much more than it has done. I feel it has done very little. Because that money was a lot. Where has that money gone? I mean, apartments in Nigeria went up. <laughs> mm. Yes, but if 
if there was more of transparency. Yeah. When Brian spoke about the, the land commission and all that, these things are seasonal. Why aren't they permanent? Yeah. If this was happening every day, trust me, we wouldn't be having land issues all the time. Why is it seasonal? First, first a period of time and it goes silent. That is, if we had things that were policies that were a long term, a not short term, mm -hmm. it would make more sense. I feel we would reduce on how much we are borrowing and would be investing and getting more in return. <clears throat> okay, let me get to Elizabeth. You had something to add. Yeah, I really had something to add on Enoch's uh, discussion on the question of World Bank's report mm -hmm. that uh, uh, Uganda's economy had bounced back by 4.6. Yeah. Well, I really don't know what the World Bank, what, <laughs> what, what those people meant by that. They meant. I really don't know what they meant by that. Uh, at some point, I get to think that maybe uh, the, fact, the mere fact that they are one of the multilateral creditors of Uganda, they want us to keep us in the sack of borrowing or borrowing. Uh, at some point, I thought that was the intention. But uh, uh, to get to the Uganda's economy, uh, personally, I've grown up in a more of a humble background, and I know what it means for someone to get 20,000, to get hold of 20,000 shillings out of sweat. Uh, people up here look at 20,000, you know, 20,000 shillings as uh, data, in terms of data and everything. But there are people down there that take months, actually a month, when it's getting the 20,000 Ugandan shillings. So um, if the World Bank says that our economy has bounced back by 4.6, Honestly, that gets my mind disturbing, especially when I look at the situation of many Ugandans. If we had to really, if we had to really zero down that to the real Ugandans, maybe, maybe by uh, when they address Uganda's economy, they look at Uganda as a country and they don't really get to the people, to the individuals, like individual, individual basis. Because when it comes to individuals, I really doubt that is the issue. Okay, I can see Enoch is speaking a lot from inside. <laughs> it's so, boiling. Yes. Uh, no, it's, it's <laughs> not boiling because uh, by the time the World Bank produces such a report, then we must have borrowed. And when we borrow, because it bases on our GDP, the gross domestic product ratio. So if it increases, then it means our consolidated fighter, the central bank, is big, which means it's a growing economy. So those are the kind of statistics World Bank gets at the end of the day. Because when we are looking at post-COVID, no, we look at pre-COVID, we look at COVID, Analysis. and the post-COVID. Pre-COVID, we're doing okay. The economy was moving. COVID, everything was a, just down, frozen. Down too. No one would move. Even you moving out, you would get a cane from the police. So no business. <laughs> In fact, if you look even at the reports, such things yeah. were never produced. Mm. So we look at post-COVID where our government okay, says, let's borrow from ADB, African Development Bank, or let's borrow from Stancha, or maybe the standard group like Stanley, like yeah. you talked about, Asian Bank of China. It comes out and says, okay, we want this kind of money to, one, recapitalize the businesses. We recapitalize the, the initial deposit with the domestic banks. When we give them money, they can lend, and their interest rates to the citizens is a law. So it means they're boosting. So when you talk about the World Bank report saying it has increased by 4.6, it's because our GDP is increasing. Okay. Our per capita income, per individual, maybe it's shifting from a $1 to $2. So that's what we are looking at. The margins is what we are looking at. Okay. Um, before I get back to Elizabeth, let me get back to Brian. <laughs> So, so Brian, we have had, we have seen government taking a lot of measures mm. during COVID and post-COVID for the recovery of the economy. Mm. We saw how SMEs were supported. Mm. We saw uh, Bank of Uganda allowing uh, restructuring of loans and several other measures that government took. So, 
my question to you is, do you think government did enough to ensure that um, we recover from the effects of COVID-19? Well, uh, to an extent, I think they did. To, to an extent, I think they did. And to another extent, I think they did. To the other extent of them doing, I think, by them allowing actual businesses to operate again post-COVID, that was good enough. But to the extent of um, having uh, more of, uh, what should I say, a human understanding of, you know, the situation people have come from in COVID and then post-COVID, I think that is a place where they didn't really get the pain properly. Because, you see, had we had that thorough phase of saying now, you know, there was the pre-COVID, there was the COVID, and then there was the post-COVID, then that means that you ought to have an alternative or a plan that is better than what was there before. Yeah. So if you came from COVID and then you're going into post-COVID and then you say, we have opened businesses, fine. But then now look at the tax burdens. Because now you need to look at the businessmen, the, the, the business community, because the business community is what funds the government more. If you're looking at us domestically, internally, you're looking at the business community contributing more. It, regardless of you being in real estate, regardless of you being in agriculture, regardless of you know do, doing several businesses, we are funding. Yeah, but then you don't expect us to fund more. You don't expect us to recover at the, at the same rate that we're in pre-COVID when you're increasing on the taxes. Now, that, that's why I think... Uh, in November, November, December period, that's why um, people who are dealing in import and export trade were quarreling because you know the prices were you know very funny. You get to export just a basket of tomatoes maybe to Kenya, and then you there is no ROI, you know, because you have bought tomatoes from someone or maybe eggs. You reach the border, and you're paying money that is quite very very funny, you know. If I'm expecting to get a return on investment on on maybe each tomato, maybe say 200 shillings, and then you want me to pay taxes of 150 shillings, there's no way we are going to boost. You know, it still comes back to the government being lenient. It still comes back to the Ministry of Finance coming down to the people and saying, look, I think we need to have a harmony with you guys. Let's look at how, it, how let's look at streamlining the businesses in order to get a recovery. But then now you have government saying, um, but I, I mean, taxes should move in a certain in a certain position. These are the same vehicles that you locked for nearly one and a half years counting. And then now you're telling, you know, at the start, they gave them specific passages through it, to, to pass through. And then on top of giving them specific passages to pass through, you're even uh, restricting the number of people, saying that maybe, yeah, we are just recovering. We want you guys maybe to have, what, what, what was the number? I think eight, eight something. And just have two, two. That was rather very funny. We still have border borders carrying, I think, maximum of one person. So the, the rate at which we are growing, yes, we are growing, but there is, that, there is still that pain. And now we have the pain of people who are owning schools, uh, nursery, primary, secondary, universities, facing the pain of government thinking that it can actually, it can actually put an order it thinks is good for the nation vis-a-vis -vis what, is, what is good for the nation. Because now you see they're coming out and saying you cannot increase fees. Yeah. You know? Because they're looking they, at it from the, the yeah. school fees policy. Uh -huh. They're looking at the phase of it being a government school. Yeah, the, the, Sorry, they're looking at the phase of government schools. Now you're looking at private schools that were closed. Yeah, And they, <laughs> most of these schools were running on debts. I, I own a school, literally in a nursery and primary school. We're already running on debts, choking on debts. The only thing that happened is we went to the bank and they told us, yeah, no, you know, we, we are in a COVID break and, you know, you can recover after. But then we want to recover after, and then now you're telling us, look, you cannot, because if, if primary, a person who was in P2 was telling them pay maybe 650,000 shillings per term, that was pre-COVID, you don't expect me to come post-COVID and then charge the same person 650,000. It has to increase. You know, there is, there is a way businesses operate. Expenses, we have very, we have very, very high expenses, you know, and then now you have a funny government official coming and saying you cannot exceed 650,000. Logically speaking, the only schools you even own as a government are not even developed to the standards of a private school. Okay, it becomes fine. funny. Thank you so much. We are going to take a short break and still come back to discuss is Uganda's debt sustainable? Thank you.
Digital rights are frequently violated through various unfair actions, for example, blockage of websites and social networks, theft of credentials, unauthorized use of people's data for personal gain, privacy intrusion, online censorship, arrests and intimidation of online users, internet blockages, and a proliferation of laws and regulations that undermine the potential of technology to drive social, economic, and political development worldwide. It is hence every citizen's responsibility to respect rights of other digital users and to speak out or report to the responsible parties when one's rights are violated. Welcome back from that short break. We are still looking at the status of Uganda's public debt and we are with students of Cavendish University. So before we took that short break, we had Brian and then now we are having Elizabeth. You had something to add earlier. Yes, I really, uh, I was yet to comment on his perspective on World Bank's statistics uh, about Uganda's economy. And he seemed to be very comfortable <laughs> with what World Bank had to say with about... A, with the theoretical statistics. Yes, with the theoretical statistics of World, World Bank, uh, out of which I'm not comfortable. Personally, I'm not comfortable with the statistics that come from World Bank. And I do believe that Uganda's economy is actually dead and waiting to be buried. Because here is the thing. Yes, maybe our economy is dead. Yes, <laughs> it's waiting to be buried. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, Eliza, Eliza, please expound. <laughs> okay. Uh, wow. Uh, to explain uh, that statement, oh, to a bit uh, elaborate more on why I say something like that, if we are to really uh, measure the, 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 the economic uh, growth of Uganda and the debt, because we are basically talking about the debt and the economy, Uganda's economy, we are like comparing both and, you know, getting to, to match them in a way. If we are to look at the rise of Uganda's debt right from 2000, uh, 2002, uh, the, the debt of Uganda has been rising each year. And as it rises, it reaches a point when a point that you look at and be like, okay, are we able to recover this debt? And if you had to look at the GDP of Uganda and actually put it on the same scale with the, with the debt that we have, we cannot we cannot recover with the GDP that we have. We cannot recover that debt. The debt is way high, so we still have we still have uh, uh, a lot of. Things to do. There, there are a lot of things that we need to do to really to be considered a country that has a stable economy. It's not until we are able to sustain debts like like the one that we have right now that we can be considered as uh, a country whose economy has bounced back. But and if we still have a debt of that kind, no. Okay, let me move to Enoch. So, Enoch, leaving aside the COVID-19 issue, let's talk about Uganda's capacity to collect revenue. We have the Uganda Revenue Authority, which uh, has the mandate to collect revenue on behalf of the government. Now, aside from debt uh, for the 2020-2023 for the budget, we also have money that's supposed to be collected by URA. Now, my question to you is that has Uganda done enough to ensure that it increases its basket to ensure that URA collects uh, enough revenue to meet the target for 2022-23? URA as URA is doing its job, it's doing tax collection, but there's no URA will collect tax if there's no business where to collect it from. Or there is no way where URA will collect tax if it's collecting it from just 20% of the total population. So basically, we find, like though she said, that the 20,000 is too much. We find that actually the biggest revenue is coming from the central region. I mean central with Wakisu and all the surrounding. But if at all it was collecting from maybe 70% of this population, then we would raise resources, I mean financial resources, to run this particular government. Away from that, still there are loopholes in uh, taxes because I'm a businessman, I deal in spare parts. I go with a particular person, maybe Brian, to Dubai or Japan to buy spare parts. We buy at the same exact shop, the same price, we pay the same freight fees. We come here, 
he sells at a price that actually I cannot sell. But the second person who buys from him will sell the same price that I'm selling. So that kind of loophole and inversion of taxes, if at all it's closed, I know there are very many policies to cover that. But again, I think the policy should be more stringent. I don't know how they'll do it, but it requires us another strategic plan, maybe of five or maybe of 10 years, to come and maybe have a think tank seat and we see how we can solve such problems so that we can have a greater resource mobilization from the URA. Okay. I, okay. I, I th thank you for that input. Now, my other question in that angle is on... You know, there are policies that have been put in place. We have the, the tax laws that are amended every single year. Sure. URA has customs agents at every single port. Mm. Now, is there something different that you are... Because, you know, URA, URA's capacity, I mean, the target has increased. Is there something different that URA needs to do? in order to, or the government of Uganda generally, in order to meet the target for the 2020 to 2023? Uh, for me, I would look at cutting the human resource. I know people will say, ah, but we have seen it in other developed countries where mm -hmm. by now we are looking at the technological advancement. Mm -hmm. Put a computer in place. There is a scanner, let every car pass a scanner. We tell every bit of it. Let it have a genuine and uniform tax levied on every good. Because, I mean, I know it's a person, person in, person out, and you, you have what to tell a computer to do for you. But let us automate everything. When you scan a good, it brings a price on the world market. Give it a particular tax, eliminating a person. Because I imagine everyone wants to enrich themselves at the end of the day. That's what you're telling me. They're agents. They are the people in uniform. No, but a person in uniform hasn't eaten since morning. Mm -hmm. So I find it easy to pay 100,000 than paying 1 million shillings at the end of the day. But you cannot pay a computer. So our technology should be, I guess, advancing every single day. If we do that, then we shall have the taxes. Okay, thank you. Let me move to Vivian. Vivian, let's talk about exports. Uganda's exports. As we know, um, y Uganda has put uh, tax on export at 0%. That means there is literally no tax on, on exports. And yet, when we look at exports vis-a-vis -vis imports, we, we, it's still very low. So what is happening? What is happening? Has Uganda done enough to ensure that um, it encourages exportation of goods outside Uganda. Um, before I answer your question, I would want to pick up from where Enoch stopped. Um, can Uganda stop implementing policies in the offices? Can URS stop that? There are so many businesses in Uganda that aren't paying taxes. There are so many people in Uganda that aren't paying taxes. But are there people going to the grassroots? Are there people going down to the field, apart from sitting in offices? You get? If, if there was that, that push to go down there, then definitely I feel that tax, the, the taxes, the tax revenue that Uganda is receiving would increase at some point. Mm -hmm. Because there are so many people that aren't paying taxes. You realize the person paying taxes is someone earning 500,000. And someone who is making billions of money every day isn't paying those taxes. Why? I feel we should stop this whole office thing. Mm. Yeah, come here, speak, and nothing is done. URA is not doing enough, honestly. If I am, if I am to rate it, I feel URA is just doing 10% of their job. Where is the 90%? And yet they're like earning salaries from our money that we are paying as taxes. I feel that should be worked on. Then back to the <coughs> exports. I feel Uganda is, as a country, we aren't really encouraging exports a lot. Because 
you realize that people exporting are are foreigners, if I would say. People who have come to invest in Uganda and are taking back to their countries. But us as Ugandans, we, we, as Ugandans, where is our, our patriotism here? Why? What, what, what are some of the underlying reasons? It's basically because of... I feel everything is centered around corruption. Every problem Uganda is facing currently is centered around corruption. Corrupt mindsets. Corrupt mindsets. If people were not foolish enough and not self-centered, Uganda would be very far. If you are bringing, for me, seeds to grow, let me say coffee, but the seeds you're bringing for me are poor quality, how much am I going to export? You're bringing fertilizers that are costing a lot of money, yet they are poor quality. It starts with the little things they are doing to push people to, to invest in businesses. If, if you're giving me good quality seeds, definitely my, pro my products are going to come out really well and I will export. Give me quality and I'll produce quality. Definitely the country will progress. But not, don't give me poor quality and expect me to produce quality. How? That doesn't add up. Okay. Yes, Enoch. Maybe to add on to this, uh, I understand this is uh, a Greek based economy. Like basically everything we do is a Greek. Talk about the coffee, talk about maybe the palm oil and all that. So it's maybe our exports. We do exports, but the foreign currency we get back, again, it's maybe our shilling is also depreciated. Mm -hmm. But again, we do not fetch what we want. There's no value addition. At the end of the day, we give you coffee. They give us Nescafe. So we fetch little of the, at the market, international market. And maybe before we go away from that, I talked about the technology. You see now there's new technology of IFRIS, electronic fiscal mm -hmm. invoicing. And Receiting and invoicing. Yeah. Yeah. Like the other day I paid something at the, at the, the supermarket. And they told me they can't take it back because it'll be changed. Two million shillings. There was no person. It was just a computer. It's reflected at URA. So... We as traders, we've been scared, so I'll embrace the technology so that I can see the revenue going up. But back to her, for me, I think our exports, for us to gain out of them, we should be able to give more than what we are giving. Value, add, value, value addition is the way to go. If, if I have my toke, let me dry it, package it well, put it on the national market. If I have incendiary, now the delicacy, Make it very nice. Put it to the market. You fetch more. Hence, getting a foreign exchange in terms of the dollar, maybe or something. That's when maybe we shall realize more as getting from the exports. Yeah, but but then I, I I think the problem I have with that is that you, you see, <clears throat> you cannot bite the hand that feeds you. Yeah, we we as a, we, we we are in a country where we can't even fund sixty percent of our own budget. Yeah. So we can also not, at the end of that, they dictate the prices at the global market. So there is a way this whole thing moves. When you have the products, yes, you have the products. Now, I'm not refusing the fact that we are doing more of raw, and even if we do, you know, we put in the value addition. When the products go, you know, there is the, the, global, the global trade pricing that is put on it. Obviously, it doesn't vary at for. It's not the same for a number of reasons. But then again, you cannot go there and dictate yet. The people who are actually putting the prices have a higher economy than you. They're the ones that feed you. I mean, we are now looking at the terms of the loans we get per year. Uh, you, you know, maybe some I think we even get per three months. But then again, you cannot you, you cannot go there and try to push a policy, yet it's me who's feeding. It's like, for, for example, it's, it's saying I'm so going to pay should, attention. Should that be the status that Uganda has to agree to? No, we, we don't need to agree to that. You see, again, it has to be us to, first of all, become me mentally bright. Because we, the government, not, not us, obviously, the citizens, they have to be mentally bright. Because, you see, if they would start with knowing that they need to be patriotism, not patriotism of, of the tweets and saying I'm patriotic. No, 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 no. Not the patriotism of you coming and holding a, a state of nation address and then you say we are patriotic. Oh, oh, oh you see, we fought and what, what, what for patriotism. Not that patriotism. We're meaning patriotism that is implemented. You coming up and saying, "Look, I think this time around, let, let's let's 
you know, because different sectors contribute different percentages. It's, it's by you saying, you know what, let's try to reduce on the debt accumulation because when you reduce at least on the debt, you can at least have a say. When you reduce on the debt, and yes, you bring in the factor that people are now, you know, being more patriotic, we are putting in the value addition, we are getting our businesses running. That is good. That is what we, the locals, can do. But what the government can help people do is to help and reduce on the debt accumulation. That is through debt repayment, not getting a loan to pay a loan. No, no, no. Mm. Just using the revenue that we have in between. We, we have seen North Korea doing these things. Australia did this and succeeded. Nigeria is doing this. They have succeeded. At least, not, not really succeeded, but they are somewhere. They, at least now they can debate Australia can actually now speak on a price they want for their certain raw materials. Now we are looking at their minerals. Nigeria, the same. South Africa, I mean, Egypt, the same. And then now Uganda, you expect us to have the same bargaining cap. You cannot have the same bargaining power with people that feed you. It can never happen. It's, it's like me saying, if my parents, if, if maybe I'm, I'm in O level, yeah? My parents, obviously, highest chances is that they are going to pay my tuition for A level, yeah? And I get my, I, I get my what? Second grade. And then, my, and then my dad tells me, ah, now, gentlemen, you see, I'm taking you to Lira College. There is no way, there is no way I'm going to start telling him, daddy, not me, I want to go to SMAC. First of all, I've gotten a second class. <laughs> second class. <laughs> second I've gotten a second grade. Secondly, I'm not paying my tuition. So you don't have that bargaining power. Maybe you can just say, oh, but I think you only end on this. That even narrates us to why when we have world, the United Nations meetings, it's them that speak first. By the time we come to speak, they're out, they're having coffee in the, in the, in the corridor. They're discussing other important things. We are now speaking to our fellow African presidents. That's how the world works. Okay, so let's, let's shift and now address, <laughs> let's address the, the, the question in the, in the discussion. Mm. We, have, we, we started by looking at the general overview. We looked at the COVID situation. Mm. We looked at the different factors that came out earlier that affect the issue of debt. Now, and I'll start with Elizabeth, yes. the question in the room. The public debt stands at over 73 trillion. That is according to the budget. Mm -hmm. And um, as we know the trend lately, Uganda's public debt keeps on growing. So as we sit here, it must be growing somewhere. So is, the, is Uganda's public debt sustainable? Um, thank you. Well, uh, in response to that question, personally, I feel Uganda's debt, Uganda's debt would be sustainable if we were not having uh, the kind of government that we are in. Ooh. It would, <laughs> because... <laughs> there is a drone outside there. Um, <laughs> uh, I was actually uh, talking to Brian of, uh, of air, and I was telling him, do you know what? If you are to look at the, the, the increment of the debt from 2002 to, 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 to debt, the debt keeps on increasing at a certain level. And I was telling him that actually if uh, the, late, uh, uh, the late president, Amin Dada, was not brutal in his policies, he would be my best president. And I was giving him my reasons. But uh, back to, obviously, to the current, <laughs> to the current sort kind of government that we are in, this, this debt would have been sustainable if we are not under this kind of servicing. Because honestly, even the blind can see that uh, our leaders are not, really, are not really taking on the, 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 they are not really playing their roles rightly to, uh, to our country, Uganda. Because if they were, we wouldn't be at such a state of indebtedness, honestly, would not be there. Because um, while I was actually doing some reading, I noticed that uh, Israel, uh, Israel was a uh, leading producer of fruits, mm -hmm. and I noticed that they actually got their soils from Uganda. Mm -hmm. So in my head, I was like, okay, if we had given the whole Uganda to Israel, even just for a year, we wouldn't be facing the same problems that we are facing right now, economic problems that we are facing right also now. Also the loan we give to the Arabs. Yes. So literally, it's just our policies, the government policies should be checked. We are, we've, we've really given uh, NRM as a government enough time to prove their worth. Because honestly, uh, well, yeah, we do appreciate the fact that, uh, that they actually saved us from the whole traumatizing uh, season of, um, 
of uh, disrespect of human rights, but uh, they have a bit become really very reluctant and 30 years of, 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 of ruling and leading are just enough to show that if these people still stay, we are going to succumb to indebtedness till infinity. I think, uh, uh, okay. Maybe. okay, as, as you mm. answered that, mm. as you give a res I don't know if it's a response it's or a addition. Just an addition. Okay, as you give an addition, mm. then you'd also answer the question of whether the debt is sustainable. Okay. Well, I think that debt is sustainable. It would be sustainable. <laughs> you see, we, she talked about uh, the late president, I mean, that does regime. We managed to give a predominantly desert country or, or kingdom a, a loan way back. And now we, we are not even at the same position to give them a loan now. I mean, realistically, we, ca we cannot. And then we, we I think, what? Well, well, you could say we are kind of more developed than them. We could say maybe to a certain percentage. They use that money and look where they are. Okay, on top of other debts that they had, because if you look at the Arab nations, then they were heavily in debt. When you look at now, they are not really heavily in debt. They actually, now they, they came about the, the petrodollar system thing. They are mm. nearly clocking out of debt. And then us, we gave them a loan. We are now, you know, Taking a lot of milk to go to go and expose to what, what was that thing called? The, the fair that happened in uh, Dubai. Dubai. Yeah, in Dubai. Dubai. And the we, expo. The, the expo, yes, that's what I was looking for. And then we're taking a lot of milk alongside other funny things. So, really, you know, it comes back to the implementation thing. Whether our debt is sustainable, I think that is a very funny question. With I wouldn't want to say it on air, but uh, well, I think it's. it's <laughs> it's, 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 a it's, 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 it's it's a very funny question because the debt that was there when they came into power and now is not the same obviously you could say logically it cannot be the same debt will always increase yes that is there but as to whether you're actually taking keen interest on serving the people I think that is a very very different question you could argue out and say every country has a debt fine there's no problem with that every country has a debt on top of us being landlocked you're, you're not even doing the list of saying let's have service delivery because then if you had the service delivery, people will come and pay for certain products. In the long run, you will generate revenue and maybe say, look, oh, by the way, we know you guys may try to be funny. These are the laws that we have for corruption. We shall implement it in this way. Yeah, These are the laws we have for revenue collection. We shall implement it in this way. We have a proper administrative structure for each and everything. We have resources going to where they are supposed to go. You see, now that comes back you, you know, I, I was telling her off I was telling her that uh, certain districts took back money that they didn't use at the end of the year. And yet, when you go back to the districts, you, you really ask yourself, why did you take back the money? Because you don't even have anything. I, I wouldn't want to name my own district, but that, that's a story for another and day. Several districts, they several. were publicly listed, yeah. Like in Tongamo district, you saw the amount. We took, we took back, I think, like 12 billion. And yet, I was there this festive season, and I was asking myself, okay, why did these guys take back the money? You know, would have used this money help SMEs grow, as he said, is an advocate for SMEs, help SMEs grow, because at the end, they're going to pay taxes, you're going to generate revenue, and maybe um, in Rwanda, in, in, in Rwanda around, uh, I think, 20, 2018, that's when I was joining the level, in 2018, the Minister of Finance, okay, this may not apply to Uganda, the Minister of Finance, as well as, uh, you know, I think, in conjunction with, uh, with, uh, with the President, they came up with a formulation on how to decrease their debt. And it's, it's, it's working. What they did is that they got every, how do I call this thing, uh, t tax sectors to pay a certain section. Now, it was just more of an address, but it's, it's happening because they created a back, a, more of a back account that would help them pay certain debts. Now, they released a list, um, I think they started with more of their internal debts then. I don't know if now they have progressed to the, uh, to the external debts. But then they listed the debts that they had and now every sector is contributing to uh, the loan repayment. Say maybe tourism, at the end of every month, you had to, maybe the tourism sector at the end of every month had to put in 3%, the guys of agriculture at the end of every month had to put in 3% on top of the 100, <coughs> you know, because then I think you stay like with 97%. So there was a lot of money that was flowing in for, for uh, the debt repayment. So every after three months, they would calculate, tell the people how much money that certain sectors, certain uh, taxable sectors have put into their system. And then they use that money to pay off a certain debt. Now, because they were starting from the, I think they were starting from the lowest to the highest debt. 
And every three months, I can tell you the government of Rwanda was putting out a publication on deaths that have been done. But then come to Uganda, I, I remember Matia Kasaija talked about something like that, wherever it went to. So whether our debt is really sustainable, it comes back to the administrative structure. I believe, yes, we can if we decide to. If we, if we decide to become very human, I think we can really sustain it. Okay, let me have Enoch on the same issue. Our advocate. Hmm. Yes, <laughs> advocate for, for SMEs. SMEs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, thank you. Uh, now, the issue is public debt sustainable. Mm -hmm. That's a tricky question. We have had an overview of a debt. We know what it is. Mm -hmm. So, when we put public to the debt, that means everyone must pay yeah. that. So, to the bits of sustainability, it means if we are getting the debt, we are not hurting our children or the grandchildren. Mm -hmm. It must be at a balance. Mm. So if I'm addressing a public debt being sustainable, in my sense, I think government has enough securities. It has enough. We have things abroad. We have oil now, 2024, 2026. That's yeah, and uh, if you look at even our charter and even our Public Finance Management Act, mm -hmm. the themes okay. like sections like section uh, 62, then we have section 42. We have uh, section 42 in the charter still. Talk mm -hmm. about the oil. So for me, if I'm getting a debt externally, not internally, I'll, I'll, I'll first of all distinguish that. Externally, and it's a long term, not mid. And I say I'm getting monies from Aruho for the next 20 years to finance a project of power or to finance industrialization maybe in Wero. Mm. I'll look at it holistically. I'll look at it at the balance of payments or export. I'll look at it at uh, unemployment. I'll look at it mm. at the national budget, the resource mobilization I'm talking about. I'll look at it still at uh, maybe the foreign currency coming in. To cut down the inflation and everything. So for me, I would rather get an external debt, which is quite high, to address all the primary balances. If I get that, maybe within 20 years, without the corruption we're talking about, everything at a balance, I would get the debt. I would not get the internal debt because a bank can still get me money, maybe standard chartered, maybe 10 billion shillings, but you'll be on my neck to pay back at maybe at a very short time. Whereby even my, my ROI is not yet mm. back. Then I choke on it, then I have to borrow to pay. So in other words, I would look at this as Uganda can borrow from the external sources. We sell our borrowing obligations, maybe to the funders. And then they give us the money. But which are long term? To finance public investment structures, for a long run. But then, you see again, I think the problem with that is that most of these guys are willing to fund for the agricultural sector, not necessarily the industry. You know, I wouldn't want to say this, but I think it's more of a colonial... Uh, no, it's, it's, it's you because... Know, the, the, no, I, I know what it's saying. Direct the direct investment. The direct investment. Mm -hmm. But still, even what he's talking about, the donations and the funders they're talking about, because they, they see a lot of risk of investing into this country. If... I won't say because I'm scared. I won't say about the government. Hey, yeah. If <laughs> yeah, it's a free space, <laughs> but I don't want to mention that because as as you wind up, yeah, as I wind up, <laughs> because if if there was if there was minimal risk of investment into this country, everyone would come. But because we can't risk to invest, so we have to opt for the external public debt. Okay. Advocate. Let me move to Vivian on, on that issue, though in, a, in a, different, a different question. So how best can Uganda manage the issues of public debt? I would borrow what Brian said earlier. If we could take a leaf from Rwanda. If our ministries would do more of bringing back than just taking, it would do a lot, a whole lot, to Uganda as a country. Then investing the borrowed money in the right places. 
is it all? Those two points are just enough for it all. If the, if the ministries are doing more of bring than take, good. Invest in the right places and get good returns. We'll would be good to go. As a okay, country. thank you. Precise. Okay, Brian is saying precise. So I will push <laughs> that back to, <laughs> to Brian as well. So Brian, here we have, we have a debt already. So how best can Uganda manage its, its public debt? But me, I'm not very precise. Like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we, we have the debt, yes. We already have the debt. I think uh, we need a government to take up um, certain things. One, the administrative structures very seriously. Because the administrative structures can determine whether you actually, we, whether we can actually implement your directives as the head of state or something, or we can partially implement them, or on, to, the, to a worse extent, may not really uh, you know, implement them. That still breaks down on whether we can repay back the debts or not. Uh, secondly, I think we need more awareness about uh, certain things because we really haven't had, we've had awareness, the urban sort of awareness in English and to the corporates them, you know, the, the suits and they understand English. <laughs> we need to break this down. You, you see, I'm more of a Pan-African and uh, it has got many issues with uh, my neighbor here mm -hmm. and uh, a few colleagues. So I think let me address this looking the same. <laughs> you see, when her colleagues came a number of years back, when her colleagues came, you know, they bought for us this whole, ha! No, so can I use the word? Precise, you said, go on, say okay. precise. Okay. They gave us this whole fallacy of Christianity and, and you know, whatever, whatever she believes in and her community. So for them to help us understand that whole, I don't know, illusion of Christianity, they didn't necessarily just leave it in English. They went down, broke it down into Runyankore, Ruchiga, Rutoro, Rukonjo, what, 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 so that so you would easily adapt, you would easily understand what they're telling you. Now, coming back to point, I think now I can change. If our government now can help create enough awareness to the ground and tell people, look, this is the issue we actually have, let's kindly, let, let's be patriotic, let them be patriotic, let them follow the administrative structures, let's have enough Awareness, three months are enough. Three months are really enough for awareness in different languages. Let's get down to the university students. Let's at least, you know, like what CCG does. Let's have a debate. Let's show awareness. Let's, you know, it's also part of awareness, creating awareness, telling people that, look, you need to be morally upright for us to actually move on forward. And then let's also have certain people taken off from different offices. Comes back to the administrative structures. Ministers. I wouldn't want to say names, but me, I don't fear people. Ministers such as Chris Bariomos, you should not be in, 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 in certain ministerial positions. Yeah? Because now you need ministers that actually going to implement things, not people that you're putting there to bootleg you to... to Psychopaths. Yeah, people just to support you. You need, I mean, I don't know if this can be put off air, but anyway, let's, let it just stay on. We have a prime minister who cannot really address a nation. If we can't start with meritocracy, then you'll have a proper administrative structure. This other things of corruption, you see, corruption is to a certain degree and also that affects how you pay back your debts. If you have guys that are actually literate and know what they ought to do for a certain position, fine. If you have people such as Robin and Abanja being the prime minister of a country, cannot address a country, cannot even speak in parliament freely and speak sense, then we are in for a shock, but you know, anyway, okay. it's the country we are in. Okay, as, as we move towards the end of the show, because yeah. we have run out of time, mm. yes. I'll give time for each panelist to give their concluding remarks. I think Enoch will feature what you would like to Advocate. add in your concluding sure. remarks. Advocate. Yes, <laughs> and I'll start with Elizabeth. Oh, well, um, as we conclude, I would really like to sort of add my voice on how uh, Uganda can actually. Uh, uh, sort of manage their economy and somehow sort of uh, reduce on the urge of borrowing money from both domestic and you know foreign mm. creditors. Well, my main point is is that Ugandans, or not just Ugandans, but the government should really. Uh, put a lot of effort in the economic drive because if it is agriculture they should really put a lot of effort in the economic drive because when you happen to um, bring in the question of imports and exports and where uh, we are not actually
still getting the amount of funds that we need, and yet the exports are not taxed and imports are taxed. Where is the problem? I think what the, the amount of, 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 of um, product that we are exporting may not be enough or it may not be of quality. So the government should really invest enough in the economic drive that they choose to, uh, uh, that they choose Uganda, like, like, like the economic drive that they choose for Uganda. Like, for instance, like, uh, uh, like Israel, they chose technology and everything is visible, everything is visual, they chose, they chose to concentrate on one. So we shouldn't look at investing in almost everything and ending up at zero. Let's invest in one and we're good to go. Yes, Enoch. Yes, thank you. We are running out of time, yeah, so we we'll summarize. Uh, so for me, I would, uh, I would anticipate that the government should continue borrowing because I find money as a necessity and a basic need. So if it borrows, please help me, government. Just prioritize the priorities. Find something. If you prioritize that it's roads and healthcare, prioritize the priority. Have the healthcare, the basic thing, so that every individual is okay. They can go the next day to work and then you get the, the, the resources that you, you need. Want. Yeah. Okay. So I think that's, that's what I would have to say. Yes, Vivian. I would sum up with three things. One, let's have long-term implementation of policies. Yep. Let's just not state the policies, but let's implement them for a long time. Mm -hmm. Two, save the administrative system. It's as simple as that. Save it and we shall be good to go. Three, sensitize the masses. People are there, but they don't know what taxation is. People need the figures. Let people go down to that person, that illiterate person that is in the village. Educate them. And I believe we shall be good to go. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And lastly, Brian. Oh, no. <laughs> um, as a country, we should... Uh, really follow and respect our administrative structures. We should uh, secondly try as much as possible to educate ourselves on facts that are, that are failing the nation and that are paining the nation, such as corruption, so that we have a better tomorrow. Okay. Thank you so much. We have come to the end of our talk show for today. I would like to say thank you to Cavendish University for honoring our invitation and being part of the show. So I'm hoping to see the three of you back again. Uh, Brian, I know he will still come back. He has been coming back. <laughs> yes. So thank you so much to Center for Constitutional Governance and Civic Space TV for organizing the Inter-University Debate, which is a platform where university students are able to discuss matters that affect the nation, affect the world, and specifically affect the youth, which is the bracket where they belong to. Thank you so much to our viewers for watching. Feel free to comment, uh, go on Twitter, tag CCG, Civic Space TV. Let us know whether what, what you think about the status of Uganda's public debt. From us, we'd like to say thank you, goodbye. See you again next week, same time. Mm -hmm.